Please join me in welcoming Mike Schreiner. Is Mike here? <laughs> ah, there you are. <laughs> Thank you for that kind introduction, Tracy. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and to see Rocco's bright, smiling face here this morning. I, um, I just want to take a moment before I begin and acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people, specifically the Ojibwe, Chippewa, and Algonquin peoples, and this land is covered by the Williams Treaty, and I attempt in every decision I make at Queens Park to learn from indigenous peoples about the importance of making decisions that not only benefit us today, but for the next seven generations. And I also want to take a moment, I had some time yesterday to spend in uh, Bracebridge, and we did a town hall last night, and I had a chance to tour some of the flood-torn areas and meet with residents. And I just want to say a big thanks and shout out to the Chamber for your donation to the Flood Relief Program. I know that's greatly appreciated. And I just want to take a moment to thank the volunteers, um, the emergency responders, and the military personnel for being here. I had a chance to uh, travel in a gentleman's name, George's truck, and he was telling me it's a new 4x4, and he was moving military personnel in and out of the floodwaters. And I can tell you, I was pretty nervous myself going through some of those waters. And just a shout out to Mayor Graydon Smith for the great work he's done and the leadership he's shown. Uh, as many of you may or may not know, yeah, please, please. As many of you may or may not know, uh, I'm a longtime business owner and entrepreneur, and I don't think I have to tell the people in this room, but entrepreneurs make the impossible possible. And it's one of the things I love about being a business person. When I started one of Ontario's first organic food businesses, people told me it was impossible to think about changing the food system. When I started one of Ontario's first local food marketing organizations, people told me, how are you going to market local food uh, in a global marketplace? And I think the menu at this facility itself will tell you, give you an answer to that. And when I decided to, when somebody told me we need a business leader to lead the Green Party, uh, and I said, yeah, I'll take on that challenge, and people said it would be impossible to elect a Green in Ontario, and we've proven them wrong on that one as well. And so I believe it is absolutely critical that the business leaders of this province help us address the biggest challenges we're facing. I did an interview yesterday with a reporter uh, talking about the over 100 CEOs who signed a letter in support of the province's basic income pilot project and the news, uh, the news conference we did with those business leaders. And she asked me, what's the role of business in addressing the climate crisis, which I would argue is the biggest challenge we face. And I told her, I said, it is absolutely critical and it's absolutely essential because businesses know how to deploy capital they know how to manage human resources, and they know how to deliver solutions efficiently and effectively. And if we're going to address this challenge, the challenge that millions of young people, once again yesterday on the Fridays for Future, uh, marched around the world asking leaders to step up. And I believe it's essential not only for political leaders to step up, but for business leaders to step up. And so I believe it's essential that we build a bridge, a bridge that we can walk across comfortably and confidently to, be, to make Ontario a leader in the fastest growing sector of the global economy. That's the $26 trillion clean economy, an economy that the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, says needs a deployment of capital on an annualized basis of $7.5 trillion. And the question for me is, is Ontario going to generate the prosperity and the jobs of the global leader in that economy or not? And what's it going to take? What's it going to take for us to be a leader in that area? And I would start with, we need to ensure investor confidence in this province. And I think it is challenging and difficult to do that when you have a current government ripping up contracts. I grew up on a farm. My dad used to do million dollar grain deals on a handshake. And to think the Ontario government would rip up contracts 
which I thought were sacred for conducting business in a free market society. Secondly, we live in a free society with free speech and free markets and free enterprise. And to suggest that a government could impose its own propaganda on businesses, whether you support the message or not, it's not the issue. It's compelling businesses to deliver a message mandated by government as the threat of a $10,000 fine. And I want to thank the Ontario Chamber of Commerce for standing up for free enterprise and free speech. And I think it's absolutely dangerous. Current legislation before um, the Ontario legislature would eliminate the ability of businesses and citizens to sue the government when they've been harmed. And I'm sorry, nobody is perfect in this society. People make mistakes, and we have the rule of law to adjudicate those mistakes. And I think it's dangerous to take that away from the businesses and the citizens of this province. Secondly, I think it's absolutely critical that we establish an innovation economy in Ontario. Linda Hassenfratz, the largest employer, uh, the CEO of Linamar, the largest employer in my riding, has talked about how essential it is that across Ontario we create local innovation ecosystems. And I believe if we are going to do that, we cannot be cutting university and college budgets. We need to be investing in people and skills. I believe we have to address Ontario's ability to commercialize and scale innovation. I support tax changes that will facilitate that. We're really good at research and development, but we are not very good at commercializing and scaling innovation. And I think it's absolutely critical we do that. I also believe it's important that we increase the employer health tax exemption for small businesses to provide them with immediate cash flow relief so they can scale up employment and pay those employees a living wage. And finally, I believe it's absolutely essential that we continue to support innovation hubs across this province. I can tell you places like Innovation Guelph and Communitech and other places have fostered the development of job creation, innovation, and new business startups, and that needs to continue in Ontario if we're going to succeed in the 21st century economy. Next, I think it's absolutely critical that we keep the 16 to 24 billion dollars a year we ship out of this province to purchase energy from other jurisdictions. Which isn't to say we're not gonna rely on energy from other jurisdictions, but I believe it's absolutely critical that we keep that capital, those jobs, and that prosperity in Ontario. And how are we doing it? We're doing it at places like the University of Guelph where the Bioproducts bio uh, uh, Discovery uh, Center is developing research of how do we use products grown right here in Ontario in the automotive sector and other sectors. The Bioindustrial Innovation Center in Sarnia developing ways we can use products from the forestry and agricultural sector to develop uh, plastic, bio-based plastics. It's developing an electric vehicle strategy for Ontario. We know that $250 billion globally is going to be invested in EVs between now and 2023. And the question is, is Ontario going to lead that revolution or are we going to lose jobs to it? And I would argue we need to lead it. I just had a round table at the Brampton Board of Trade a couple weeks ago. ABB, one of our, our top manufacturers in robotics, particularly in the automotive sector, told me that it's essential, it's essential that Ontario lead the EV revolution to maintain our competitive advantage in the auto sector. <clears throat> we have to invest in 21st century infrastructure. That means developing the transportation systems to get our goods to, and people to market. It means broadband all across this province. It means affordable electricity, which is why I'm calling on the Ontario government to sell surplus electricity that we're selling at a loss to Ontario's mining and manufacturing sector so we keep that money and those jobs in Ontario. I think it's absolutely critical that we put evidence before ideology, which is why I'm calling on the government to put forward an independent public review of the costs of all current sources of electricity generation and future sources so we can make decisions based on evidence and not ideology. And finally, and I know I'm almost out of time, 
I finally want to tell you that I believe deeply in markets. My dad was a farmer and entrepreneur. I was an entrepreneur and a longtime business owner before going into politics. And I would argue that revenue neutral carbon pricing is simply a market mechanism to help us solve the climate crisis. Do we want to do that through expensive government mandated regulations or do we want to unleash the power of the marketplace? I want to unleash the power of the marketplace because I know the business leaders and the innovators in this room will help us solve this crisis. And I want to work with you as a partner in doing that because I know in Ontario we know how to get things done. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for the great work that you do for our province. Thank you so much, Mike, for, for coming up and for speaking to us and giving a, a bit of a barn burner. That was a, that was a great speech. Thank you. <laughs> I feel passionate about business, economy, and ecology, just so you know. That's awesome. So, Mike, I, I have to tell you, um, we had John Frazier, the interim leader of the Liberals, on the stage yesterday. And he was talking a bit about his experience with what Doug Ford called his minivan caucus. And I figure you have no sympathy for John Frazier, do you? <laughs> you, you have John is a good guy, though. I will he, tell you the Guelph Storm is going to knock off the Ottawa 67. Okay. The <laughs> <laughs> so um, although you have uh, well, a caucus of, of one, a unicycle caucus, I guess we could call it, you... you <laughs> I say that I say that with affection because I I have been really impressed by how much you're punching above your weight, and we saw last week uh, the Green Party released their alternative sticker to the gas station stickers with the cost of climate change, which was really smart. Um, and so you know it's been really impressive to see what you've been doing for the past year, uh, all basically on your on your own. So well done. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just want to be clear to everyone that. Um, the Green Party is so committed to working with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce that I demanded that 100% of our caucus be here this morning with you. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, Mike, you spoke a lot about, um, about the environment, about climate change, climate pricing, but also markets. Uh, and I, I think that you've, you've got a receptive audience here, but one of the things that keeps coming up as a concern for Ontario business, especially those businesses that are smaller or that aren't in high tech or green tech sectors, is competitiveness. So if we're taking action on climate change, if we have a carbon tax or carbon pricing, but our, our closest competitors aren't, how do we as a province stay competitive? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I, um, I would argue that one of the reasons I'm so um, uh, adamant about looking at electricity pricing is is that you know Ontario has done a lot uh, to reduce carbon pollution through the coal phase out, and we've had a lot of spin-off public health benefits. We don't have smog days anymore, and I can tell you, you know, uh, emergency room visits for people with asthma and respiratory illnesses and things like that are down, which is saving us money in the healthcare sector. But we. Pay, we paid a price for that in significantly rising electricity prices, which to me is an indication of um, uh, taking a regulatory approach. Most economists will tell you this, including a lot of conservative economists, that th that is a, a more expensive approach. And if you take a market-based approach, and I would argue a revenue-neutral uh, approach, putting a price on pollution and returning all the money back to people, uh, is the best way to go about um, redu meeting our climate obligations. I personally would like us to have a, um, a uniform federal approach because that then allows us to do things like if we want to look at carbon tariffs or other things to create an evil playing field, those opportunities are available to us, which they aren't if it's just a province by province ap approach just because of you know trade regulations and things like that. Um, but I think we can offset costs by investing in, in helping businesses innovate. There's a company in my, um, in my writing, uh, Trade Force Tech. They do amazing work with some of Canada's largest companies as well as small and medium-sized businesses. They're helping businesses save millions of dollars a year through everything from lighting retrofits to HVAC re uh, retrofits to 
looking at their uh, transportation systems and how we can drive um, carbon out of them. I mean, you can operate an electric vehicle, for example, at one-fifth the cost of a gasoline-powered vehicle. So it's, I think it's a combination of using market mechanisms, but also spurring innovation. I think, you know, the Chamber has called for uh, tax changes to support the scale-up and commercialization of innovation. I'm all for that. Like, like, let's innovate. Let's get it out there. Let's help companies effectively um, um, uh, reduce their energy costs, which will directly benefit their bottom line, while at the same time uh, benefiting the planet. That's great. So the other kind of big issue that we as a, a chamber uh, like to, to wrestle with is that of fiscal responsibility. A bit of an evergreen issue for us. And so obviously we're a big fan of balanced budgets and, and carefully paying down the debt. Uh, what would be your approach to fiscal responsibility? Yeah, I wish I'd had more time in my speech because I was going to talk about that. But uh, so thank you for asking. So I believe we have an obligation to leave a sustainable future, a livable future for our children. And that includes, in my opinion, addressing the climate crisis, but it also means not leaving an unsustainable debt on the back of our kids. Uh, the fact that we, you know, are spending, you know, the interest payments on debt alone in Ontario is the fourth largest spending item on our budget is completely unsustainable. And I feel like I've been putting forward a solution, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but the one policy that really blew Ontario's budget out of whack was the Liberals' Uh, they call it the fair hydro plan. I call it the unfair hydro plan. We're borrowing over $3 billion a year right now in Ontario to, to be the only jurisdiction in North America to directly subsidize electricity prices. And I believe it's completely fiscally irresponsible. The financial accountability officer has said that it's going to cost the province between 40 and $90 billion over the next two decades. Um, when the current government was in opposition, they railed against it. I mean, I remember Minister Fidelli, or well, now Minister Fidelli and I used to always be talking about how fiscally irresponsible this program is, and it's still in place. And I think uh, the current government missed a real opportunity to tackle that issue. That would have lowered Ontario's spending more than any other uh, action they've taken. And instead, they've nickeled and dimed a whole bunch of programs that I would argue are critical to the fiscal responsibility of this province to cut funding for flood prevention in half at a time when we know flooding is on the rise. Last year alone in the province of Ontario, $1.3 billion in infrastructure damage, insurable losses due to extreme weather event. In one day in the city of Toronto last August, $80 million of damage in three hours. It is, flee it is fiscally irresponsible for us not to make the investments to prevent that kind of damage because the costs are only going to escalate. To cut the tree can planting program, which, you know, assists in that area as well. To cut public health. I mean, public health is so essential to ensuring a healthy population to, to take pressure off of our health care system and our hospitals. And so we, you know, whatever happened to the old, you know, a, a, you know an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We've sort of forgotten that in Ontario, and so I think we missed a real opportunity through the Fair Hydro Plan to get the province on a faster path to balance, I would argue, uh, without nickeling diming so many programs that I believe are essential to helping us save money in the long run. That's fascinating. Switching gears a little bit, uh, you're speaking to an audience that represents nearly every corner of the province. But what we've seen since the recession is the jobs and opportunity being focused more in the GTA, a bit in Kitchener-Waterloo and Ottawa, and other parts of the provinces that are, that are that's really just being hollowed out. Um, we're undertaking a, a big project this year. We're doing a major report on regional economic development, trying to look at, from a governance perspective, what's the right approach for the government to take. But I'd really appreciate your thoughts on how to spur regional economic development. Well, first of all, I can't wait to read your report because I enjoy reading all of your reports. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Michelle. The report writer right here, right? <laughs> um, but so I would say, uh, first of all, uh, we have to make sure we have the right infrastructure in place to service all regions of Ontario. And, and to me, in the 21st century, that starts with broadband internet. I mean, the bottom line is, is you can be a startup, you can be an entrepreneur, 
anywhere in this province if you have a phone line and a broadband internet connection. And there's no reason, you know, in the same way that Sir Adam Beck had a vision of electrifying the province, you know, a little over 100 years ago, we need a vision of connecting the province today. That's essential to economic growth and job creation. Secondly, I think we have to continue to invest in regional innovation hubs. You know, I just learned in my region um, last night that Communitech, which has done such an amazing job of fostering startups and, and new companies and job creation, is laying off 15 workers because they've taken a, a you know, a more than a million dollar hit. Uh, in this budget. I think that's short-sighted. I think, and, and it's not just Communitech, we have regional innovation hubs across the province that I think are essential. And then the final one is, is making sure that we invest in communities around the province. And give you a quick example applying to this region. You know, Bracebridge is fighting to keep their hospital right now. And you know what, ha making sure we have quality health care in all parts of the province making sure that we stop closing rural schools uh, because I can guarantee you that for families, it's essential to have timely access to essential public services like education and healthcare. And then we all, and we also need to ensure that we have the transportation networks in place for the whole province. And that means not just investing in transit and the GTA, which is critical. I mean, gridlock is costing us big time in Toronto, but it's also, you know, uh, restoring passenger rail service in the north. It's about direct inner city bus connections around the province. As one quick example in Guelph, my daughter goes to Laurier and it takes her two hours to get from our house in Guelph to Laurier because there's no direct bus connection <laughs> between Guelph and KW. And I think of all the people going back and forth. And so making sure that we have those community supports in place so people want to live in communities and businesses want to invest in those communities. Well, I think you're going to enjoy reading the report and we'll make sure we send a copy to you. <laughs> so just to, to close up, uh, what's next for you? This government's coming up on its one-year anniversary. Um, is, is there anything in the works for, uh, for that, for you? <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, first of all, I hope you all enjoyed my stickers. They were really in fun, to be honest with you. But, but it was also to deliver an important message that um, we need to we need to have balance. Like, and I think I hope my comments today shows how much I really believe in economic growth and job creation, while at the same time addressing some of the big challenges. And I would argue the climate crisis is the biggest challenge we're facing. And one of the things that I'm encouraging the government to do is. I was elected really promising to do politics differently. Um, I feel like my job is to put the people of Ontario first, to put good policy ahead of partisan politics, to put evidence before ideology. And I'm really working hard for the government to spend a bit more time collaborating and cooperating with the opposition. I think they've rushed some things through and made some significant mistakes along the way. And I want to give you one concrete example. I'm on the committee that's reviewing uh, Bill 87, uh, which is it's called Fixing the Hydro Mass Bill. But um, I put forward some amendments. Uh, and there's some good things in that bill, and there's some things that are not so good in that bill. I put forward two amendments that were inspired by the Toronto Board of Trade. So one of those was that the bill would require a cost-benefit analysis when we make regulatory decisions in the electricity or the energy sector, period. And then the other one was is that we wouldn't concentrate so much power in the CEO, the new CEO position on the OEB. To me, I thought those were like good conservative amendments. <laughs> and I was kind of hoping the government would vote with me on them. And they voted them both down. And so the comment I made was, is, you know, who would have thought we're not even a year into the government into this government and the Green Party is putting f forward motion uh, amendments to a bill that was recommended by the Toronto Board of Trade, and it's the Conservatives voting against it. So I'm hoping that we can have a little more co collaboration and cooperation because I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we put forward legislation that's going to benefit the people of Ontario first and foremost, ahead of our own party interest even. We certainly respect those values. <laughs> it's always a pleasure speaking with you, uh, Mike. Thank you so much. Uh, please join me in thanking Mike for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you all for the great work that you do.